In an earlier video, I reviewed the simple DYI SDR transceiver, built primarily with off-the-shelf parts and open source software. In my opinion, for the CW op, it rivals commercial units costing many times more. For me, the strategy of turning an old computer into an integrated radio and logging platform made perfect sense. And still, after making hundreds of contacts, I get a thrill each time a new entry is added to the log. But what if you could ditch the computer and its bulk and do that role with something that looks, costs, and has the size of an Adreno? Then a DYI SDR could look more like a go anywhere radio. So that's the part of the SDR equation I'd like to speak to today. No, you can't do this with an 8-bit Adreno, but take a 2.5-inch TFT display made for the Adreno, this I2S soundboard, and a $9 STM32F411 black pill, and connect the analog IQ baseband output from a Talo mixer to the sound card's input, and with a speaker connected to the card's output, you can have this. So put the UNO back in the drawer, and please keep watching, because again, in my opinion, this simple project has a lot to offer anyone who likes to build their own gear or just is curious about the digital side of direct conversion SDRs. Now, to be clear, what I'm showing here is not a fully fleshed out solution for a specific SDR. In its current form, it has no provisions to configure the outboard hardware, like what frequency to apply to the tail on mixer. If that's needed, then that's something you'll have to add. With this understood, let's first take a closer look at what this generic solution does do, particularly from the display viewpoint. And after that, we'll peek under the hood and look a bit at the code. In its current form, all control is done with three button pairs plus the FFT display using the touchscreen as input. Starting at the left, the two upper buttons select which half of the FFT is displayed. In the lower mode, the FFT view shows those frequencies from the LO frequency minus half the sampling rate to the LO frequency. And when the top button is selected, it's from the LO frequency to the LO frequency plus half the sample rate. As shown here, the LO is 7.04 MHz and the sample rate is close to 49 kilohertz, which I'll talk more about later. So it can see almost 25 kilohertz either side of the LO. The thing to notice here is when the visible frequency group is swapped, the demodulated signal sent to the speaker doesn't change, allowing the user to look around without losing context of what's going on in the frequency they're monitoring. Directly below the FFT buttons are the speaker volume buttons. Their action is fairly intuitive. Pressing V- decreases the volume and pressing V+, does the opposite. Finally, the red and blue buttons at the far right and the FFT itself allow the user to select the frequency of interest. The FFT portion gives course control while the red and blue areas offer finer tuning. The thing to notice about the red and blue zone is the further off center the screen is touched, the larger the step change. As configured here, the step change ranges from 5 Hz at the center to approximately a kilohertz change at the top and bottom of the screen. And finally, at the bottom of the screen, the text there upstates to show the calculated RF frequency heard in the speaker. Its accuracy depends on how close the LO frequency, shown at the top, matches the actual hardware mixer frequency and, I should add, as shown here, is based on a 750 Hz side tone. Finally, the green SIG number is an S-meter of sorts. What the number actually is, is the AGC value applied to the audio signal. So, the lower the number, the stronger the signal. 
At this time, it's more proof of concept entry than a number a user would report to a distant station. Next, let me start by saying there are lots of resources out there that describe DSP theory as it relates to direct conversion SDRs. But finding real examples for hardware like what's in play here can be a bit of a challenge. So I'll try to do a quick overview of what's going on inside the black pill. And to be clear, I'm only highlighting the core parts that explain how key features unique to the F411 work. For those who want a better foundational understanding of the why and how these processes work, I've included two links below that really helped me and in my opinion are well worth your time. With that said, let's jump right to the heart of this project. And no, it's not the main loop, but the interrupt routine or the ISR as it's often referred to. To understand the governing parameters here, we need to step back and think about the project soundboard. This board, as advertised, is capable of input sample rates of up to 108 kilohertz. That's great because we all know the higher the sample rate, the more frequencies we can monitor with the FFT. But there's a catch. Higher sample rates also mean more computations needed to filter the audio to a group of given frequencies. And then there's the F411's practical clock limit of 96 megahertz, which governs how fast we can do these calculations. Long story short, when I weighed these competing constraints, I ended up using a sample rate just under 49 kilohertz and then, in DSP speak, decimated that by a factor of 8. This means that the code that executes within the ISR has to complete in under 163 microseconds. Or another way to say it is, the ISR repeats over 6,000 times a second. Now, what has to happen in those 163 microseconds? Well, to start, eight stereo 24-bit samples have to be converted to a floating-point complex array. Then a matching eight-element array, also complex, is built using sine and cosine coefficients selected to synthesize the mixing frequency needed to shift the desired carrier frequency to the positive side of the audio spectrum. Multiplying these two eight-element arrays together does that. Next, the resulting product is then added as new data elements to, in this case, a 97 element buffer. This buffer is then multiplied by a pre-constructed array of FIR coefficients. Why 97 elements or taps? Again, it's a trade-off between filter bandwidth and the time needed to do the arithmetic. With 97 taps, I could realize a filter whose bandwidth is just over 1 kHz. For CW, a narrow filter would be more desirable, but the 96 MHz clock constraint became the limiting factor. Now back to the ISR. At this point, in order to be ready for the next sample set, the contents of the data buffer is shifted forward by 8 samples. Then, the real part of the product returned by the filter multiplication is summed to yield the next data point in the audio output stream, which at this point, because of the decimation factor of 8, is approximately a 6 kHz sample rate. The value then gets multiplied by the current AGC factor. Remember the green SIG number? If it's found to exceed this preset limit, the AG factor is rescaled to a value that would yield a result of less than or equal to the maximum. After that, the scaled sample gets multiplied by the user selected volume factor. Now because of a 6 kHz sample rate, a 750 Hz tone would be pretty raspy to the ears. To improve things a bit, this new sample is compared to the last speaker sample and their difference is used to derive an intermediate value. So we now have two samples in place of the one, thus doubling the effective sampling rate to 12 kHz. 
but to use them the two floating point samples have to be converted back to four 16-bit words, two words for each sample, which is then passed back to the outgoing transmit buffer. Remember, just like the input samples came in, the output buffer is going out as sets of eight. And recognize too, this is a monophonic signal, but the soundboard has left and right outputs. In this project, the two new output values are applied to equally to both channels. That is, the first four left and right channel samples get the intermediate or derived sample value, and then the last four channel samples are assigned the actual 6 kHz value. Thanks to the F411's built-in coprocessor and the ARM4 DSP instruction set, this all happens in under 165 microseconds. For upper sideband demodulation, these were the key steps needed to convert an IQ-based input to audio. Other minor operations like building the FFT array also happen within the ISR. But in the interest of staying focused on this core function, we're ignored. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and as always, good luck with your next project.